Coming up today on the GCN Racing News Show, there has been a big change of pace as we hit the mountains at the Giro d'Italia, a race that looks like it will be as unpredictable as ever in the final week. I'll be talking about exactly why that might be. We've also got the Tour de Land, the Amakamin Bira, the race across Poland, and yet more success for Vanderpool at the latest round of the Mountain Bike Cross Country World Cup. Last week, we talked about the fact that the Giro d'Italia hadn't been the most interesting race so far. That continued, in fact, on Tuesday and Wednesday, where literally nothing happened until the final three kilometres of each stage. However, the last four stages couldn't have been any more of a contrast. We finally hit the mountains, and it's been so compelling that Chris Froome even found a way to watch it whilst out training. That is not something that we would recommend you try at home, although, as Chris himself pointed out, if anybody is capable of riding whilst looking down at their stem, it's him. Now, the first of those mountains came on Friday, with the first mountaintop finish, in fact, on the Colle del Nivelle. It was explosive, to say the very least. Nibali and Roglic had a bit of beef together, and everybody else seemed to be able to take advantage. Stage winners Zacharin, Movistar's Lander and Carapaz, and Rafael Maika, all amongst those clawing back precious time. The following day, on stage 14, it was equally as enthralling. Richard Carapaz proved himself beyond all doubt to be the strongest climber in the race this year, springing out like a jack-in-the-box with three kilometres to go to the top of the first category Colo San Carlo, and then eking out an advantage of almost two minutes by the time he reached the finish line. It turned the race on its head. Roglic, who'd been sitting in second place overall since the time trial last Sunday, was now sitting second overall to a genuine general classification contender, Carapaz. And he had yet more problems yesterday in what was a very dramatic stage. A mechanical problem saw him have to switch onto Antoine Tolhook's bike, after which he had to use a lot of power energy to chase back on on his own, an effort that undoubtedly affected him on the final climb, where he was unable to match Nibali's attack. And then, still on his teammate's bike, he crashed on the descent. Now, it didn't cost him his second place on the general classification, but it did cost him 40 seconds to two of his closest rivals. Now, there's no doubt that a big part of the unpredictability of the Giro d'Italia is down to the nature of the terrain. The roads are often narrower, steeper and more irregular than those found at the Tour de France each July. The stages are often longer too, on average, and the weather can also play a big part in wearing down the riders. However, I personally think that a lot of the unpredictability this year has been down to the strength, or lack of, displayed by Jumbo Visma. Now, I am not criticising them, far from it. They've been riding really well for Roglic, especially for such a young team, and especially when you consider that they'd already lost Robert Hessing before the race started and Lawrence de Plus during it. But they are no Team Sky. Now Team Ineos, of course, uh, we're used to seeing them put a stranglehold on the Tour de France, and you'd have to think that if Roglic had an equally strong set of teammates around him here, the GC picture would look quite different than how it is at the moment. And I'm not criticising Team Ineos either. You'd imagine that any team would have the same employment strategy if they had a similar budget, but it does hammer home the point that smaller or weaker teams can make the racing a lot more exciting and dynamic. So, is a budget cap the answer, or is it simply the craziness of the Giro d'Italia? Let us know your thoughts on this subject in the comment section down below. And you can also take the poll, in fact, which is on your screen right now. In other Giro news, a tip of the hat to Pascal Ackerman, who not only got up after his crash to limp to the finish line, but then started the following day to take third on the stage. He has since hauled his sprinter's frame over thousands of metres of elevation gain. He's not given up on that Ciclamino jersey, that's for sure. Arno Demar, the Frenchman from Groupama FDJ, took his first win of the year on stage 11, but just as entertaining as watching him power to the win, was watching his manager Marc Madio watch him power to the win. Allez mon nono, allez mon nono, allez mon nono, allez nono, allez nono, allez nono, allez nono, allez nono, allez nono. The Giro d'Italia will conclude this coming Sunday, but unfortunately we will not be seeing them go over the Paso Gavia. Organisers RCS Sport have been forced to make an alternative route with the threats of avalanches at the top of that mountain. Still, even without the Gavia, it is a brutal final week and as ever, anything could happen. Make sure to check out our daily highlights and analysis over on our Facebook page. The three-day Tour de Lain in France saw the return to competition of Groupama FDJ's Thibaut Pino, marking the beginning, in fact, of his build-up to the Tour de France this July. And it couldn't really have gone much better for him. Stage one ended up in a big bunch sprint, and it was won by 20-year-old Stefan Bissiger, riding for the Swiss national team. He flew into the final corner and had to do a really long sprint, but had more than enough strength in his legs to hold on. 
The general classification battle commenced the following day on a 121km stage, which included five classified climbs and finished up the Col de Fossil. Three riders proved stronger than the rest, and with two of them from ag 2 r it was their stage to lose. Alexander Zhenyez took his first win of the season in front of Pino and Matthias Frank. And so it came down to the final day, yesterday, and a grand finale up the Grand Colombier in the Jura Mountains. Nobody could match Thibaut Pino there. He attacked with still 11 kilometers remaining, and he'd even managed to carve out an advantage of almost a minute by the time he crossed the line. He was in front of Elie Gesbert on the stage, and he also took the overall honors ahead of Frank and Ryan Taramay of Total Direct Energy. Meanwhile, the Women's World Tour continued last week down in the Basque Country with the Amakaming Bira, a race that has been held annually since 1988. Stage one saw a return to winning ways for Yerling Dura. Her spring was wiped out by a broken collarbone, but she was a comfortable winner on the bunch sprint. Amanda Spratt's defense of her 2018 win got off to a great start the following day. Uh, she sprinted to victory from a small group at the end of what had been a particularly tough day. The following day saw Taylor Wiles take the biggest win of her career, and in fact, her first ever World Tour win. Surprisingly, that was also Trek Segafredo's first women's World Tour win since their inception at the start of this year. It was in fact a 1-2 for the team on the day, whilst coming in 21 seconds clear of her teammate Aliso Longo Borghini. And it would turn out to be a fantastic race for Trek Segafredo. Spratt sat in the yellow jersey going into the final day's racing, but an attack by Longo Borghini on the final climb with over 20 kilometers to go paid off in spades. It was a close battle, but the former Italian champion did enough to hold off the rest by just four seconds, and in taking 10 bonus seconds on the line, she'd also claimed the overall victory. Borghini hasn't won a race for over two years now, uh, but she took two on the same day. The Women's World Tour continues in two weeks' time with the Women's Tour here in the United Kingdom. Quick bit of mountain bike news for you now, for the sole reason that Matthew van der Poel took his first ever UCI World Cup cross-country win on Sunday in Novi Mesto. He and Nino Schurter, arguably the best cross-country rider of all time, were locked together until the final lap, but van der Poel put in a blistering acceleration, and in the space of 10 seconds, he was well on his way to the win. He would eventually put 19 seconds into the world champion. What it means is that the Dutchman has, in the space of just five months, won cyclocross World Cups, a world championship, one of the biggest one-day road events in the world, and now a mountain bike World Cup too. In this modern era of increased specialization, it really is quite remarkable what he's managing to achieve. Now, you may remember at the end of last year that there was much made of the fact that EF Education First were going to compete not just in pro road races, but also in a small alternative calendar. That was going to include the Three Peaks Challenge, the Taiwan KOM Challenge, the Leadville 100 Mountain Bike Race, and also the Dirty Kanza. Well, the team have just announced their lineup for the latter. Taking part in the 200 mile race, which takes place predominantly on gravel roads, will be Taylor Finney, Macklin Morton, and Alex Howes. I'm personally going to find it very interesting to see how they get on against the current specialists in that discipline. The winner of the event normally takes an eye watering 11 hours to complete it, over four hours more than a race like Paris Roubaix. Uh, we'll get our answer to that question this coming Saturday, and I'd like to wish those of you taking part the best of luck. Speaking of ultra endurance, a couple of weeks ago, you may remember we shared the start of the race across Poland, another event in a growing number of long distance unsupported races. This one, apparently, is a short one by its standards. However, Mother Nature decided to get involved and make it one of the hardest additions that the race has ever seen. Riders there are free to navigate their own route between checkpoints. From the 74 riders who started at the Velodrome in Rochlas, Poland, excuse my pronunciation, only eight would go on to finish. After a first night of constant rain, the temperature along the entire route plummeted drastically to minus four in some of the mountainous parts of the course. This would set a pattern, and constant rain, freezing rain, and snow came in the higher parts of the route, accompanying the riders for almost the entire race. Some riders battled their way through 20 hours of heavy rain non-stop, followed by a snowstorm at the top of the Pralev mountain where control point number two was located. With retirees growing by the hour, it was pretty clear that it would amount to a brutally tough battle of survival for everybody that was left out there. Finally, there were only eight riders left on the map. The fight between two leaders emerged and continued almost until the end, with Pavel Pietzka coming home in three days, two hours, 49 minutes, which was three hours and 34 minutes ahead of fellow Polish rider Christian Jakubek. 
In third was Ben Davies from Bristol, just down the road in fact, from GCN headquarters here in Bath. Uh, he took four days, two hours and 52 minutes to complete the course. The final rider crossed the line after soldiering on for five days, eight hours and 30 minutes. The race is on again in 2020, so you can put that one in your ultra endurance diary if that sort of thing floats your boat. Now, in other news, there was a big disappointment for Colombian cycling last week. The Manzano Postabon team were informed by the UCI that they had returned a second positive test in the space of just one month. This time it was Juan Jose Amador for the steroid Boldenone. It would lead to a compulsory suspension of the team from competition under UCI regulations of up to 45 days, but their absence is actually going to be a lot longer than that as the owners announced that the team would be folding with immediate effect. It's a real shame for everybody involved, particularly given that the team has developed and nurtured riders such as Naira Quintana and Esteban Chavez in the past. But I guess it's an under understandable decision. Sponsors just don't want to be associated with cheating. Right, that's pretty much all for this week. Don't forget to head over to the GCN shop if you'd like to get your hands on some Italian-inspired merchandise, including t-shirts and sweatshirts. The address for that is shop.globalcyclingnetwork and you'll probably see a link to that on your screen now. And if you would like to see what tomorrow's Giro d'Italia stage looks like, Ollie and James went to ride it last week and I can tell you it's pretty spectacular. You can find their video by clicking just down here.